hi everybody thank you so much for joining us this wednesday afternoon for our monthly aster glass door portfolio review always very very uh humbled and honored by the fantastic turnout that we have on these webinars so um wonderful to have you here my name is lauren nieves i am head of investor relations at aster realty capital as many of you know, transparency is one of our core values here at ASTA, and we're thrilled to launch our initiative to provide our investors with a clear, comprehensive look at our current real estate portfolio, and also discuss current market conditions for general real estate investing success. This series is designed to give both existing and potential investors a deep dive into our $2.7 billion portfolio. We're going to shed light on our performance, strategies, and market position. So the goal with these monthly sessions is simple, is to foster trust and confidence by offering a transparent view of how your investments are managed, especially in today's dynamic market conditions. We want to keep our investors informed, engaged, and reassured about the steps ASTA takes every day to preserve your capital. So before we dive in, I'm going to take a second to introduce the driving force behind this endeavor. Aster Realty Capital, under the leadership of Joe Burko, has risen to the current participator of a phenomenal $2.7 billion real estate portfolio. We span across 12 major U.S. markets, and we have redefined the industry standard with our consistent track record of delivering exceptional results, producing an impressive 21% annual return to our investors, well above the industry average. So tonight, we have the honor of hearing from our CEO and founder, Joe Burko. Joe, as many of you know, is a nationally recognized and inspirational entrepreneur with over uh, nearly 30 years experience in the industry. His career in commercial real estate finance and investment dates back to 1995 that just speaks volume about his expertise. He founded our the sister arm of our firm back in 2005, Burko and Associates. And, uh, you know, he, along with Astro Realty Capital, his initiative approach has earned him many prestigious awards over the years, including the coveted power broker designation by CoStar and the title of New York Signature Broker by Globe Street. Joe has also been appointed as an advisor on the New York State Real Estate Board for over nine years. He was appointed by two New York governors. So he has a wealth of information, a wealth of expertise that he is always, always willing and wanting to share with our investor base. So without further ado, I would like to introduce and welcome Joe. Joe, are you with us? I know you're with us, but... Yeah, I'm here. Thank you so much. For this wonderful introduction, Laura. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so it depends on where are you uh, texting from. I'm sorry, where are you zooming from? Uh, it might be uh, different time zones, but uh, it's a pleasure to uh, have you come and join us to Glassdoor. Really, a couple of words about Glassdoor. We, like Laura mentioned, we believe in transparency. We want you, our investors or our potential investors, to have a deep dive look um, as to how we look at the market, how we make uh, determinations to which projects we should do, what drives us, where do we find the inspirations and where do we find the deals. And once we have them, we have about 35, 36 deals uh, since the inception, how do we manage them? How is our asset management works? And hopefully we'll do the whole thing in a span of uh, the next 53 minutes. Um, and so thank you again. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge my teammates, my partners, um, uh, but starting with with Marika, um, who's uh, really uh, been doing tremendous reach out and a lot of origination and a lot of capital raise reach out. It's, uh, she's been quite instrumental. Of course, Laura, everybody knows. And if you don't know Laura, then it's time for you to uh, join our uh, Lilla Investor Club. I, mean, I shouldn't say Lilla, the Investor Club and, and get, to, uh, get to experience working with Laura. She's quite outstanding. Uh, relationship manager, and she has uh, everything that has to do with client relationships. We also have Andrew Milbank with us, uh, who's the uh, chief investment officer and also principal in the firm. He's been working with me for the last uh, 11 years or so. 
I recently have a baby, he juggles everything and he does a tremendous, tremendous job. And even though he doesn't have legal background, he sits there with the attorneys and negotiate like the best of them. Uh, we also have Alex. Alex uh, is uh, a very unique story. Alex is our uh, analyst, uh, I would say our senior analyst together with the help of Andrew and everybody else, but he's been with us since he was an intern, he came from Germany. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's, he's been really in touch with us for over the course of a number of years. And then eventually we offered him a position. So he's with us for, I think, five or six years. It's a pleasure to work with. And this is your frontline team. Of course, the team goes deeper. We have other support and a lot of research and origination and so on. But this is who we are in a nutshell. Let me just dive right in and talk about what we see in the market and uh, and keep it under, as I said, under uh, up to an hour. Laura, can you please share with us the presentation? Awesome. Very great. So as I said, Glassdoor is our opportunity to offer you transparency to what it is that we do, the things that makes this company tick and how decisions are being made. Um, let me see that I have the control. Do I have the control here or... I think I do. Wonderful. So from inception, you know, the collective experience of the individuals here uh, that you see is, a we call it 65 years. I think it's over 65 years. I myself have been in the business for 30 years, but it's, as we'll say, it's about 65 years of experience. We currently are participating in 12 seriously large and expansions markets, okay? So you know, large cities, gateway cities, where we see growth in employment, growth in population, and just the kind of dynamic that is ripe for business. Um, overall, our participation in the real estate portfolio is about $2.73 billion. Since inception, we've managed, uh, we're managing $120 million. Our average return to correct Laura, she said before 21, every quarter we do a mark to market is 23.6%. That's before we take some fees and then we hand them over to the investors. It's about 23.6% mark to market right now. We just surpassed the 3,000 unit mark and just surpassed the 4 million square feet in overall real estate participation. Um, this is what it looks like. If you open up a map of the United States, these are the various states and the various markets that we're participating in. And this is something that we share with our investors, both old and new. Um, this is a comprised sort of like a presentation of the 35, 36 deals that we have done since inception. What's below the line is all the deals that we've actually exited and the and the returns. But you can really have a full understanding of every deal that we do, where whether it is a preferred equity deals, whether it is a senior position, whether it is a joint venture, all those different positions are there. Our position in the deal, the valuation of the property, the location, all that good stuff is available to you. So you can see that anything below the line are the exits. As I said, we're very proud of the fact that um, since inception, going through everything that the market had went through, the ups, the downs, the coronas, the inflations, the uh, supply chain issues, everything combined with all the lengthening, we have zero losses. Zero losses, and the average, as you know, is over 23% on an annualized uh, basis. So we're very proud of that. And that does not mean that uh, mistakes cannot happen. That does not mean anything other than the fact that we have a very solid track record and it has to do with this wonderful team that you see here. Um, and, and I definitely want, I have a lot, a lot to thank for and a lot to acknowledge here. We also like to break things down as asset under management, you know, where we invest, what do we spend money, where we put money into. And you can see that Joint venture equity positions, you know, we've had 17 since inceptions. You can see at the bottom the positions that we have actually exited, what's active, and sort of like how things are running all together. You know, if the mark to market is essentially $206 million, which means this is what we've expect is about an 80, call it about 80, um, $86 million in potential profits that uh, we're expecting to realize. Some of this has already been realized. Uh, in terms of locations, as I mentioned, seven states, anywhere from New York, we have a good heavy concentration in New York. We have had since inception 23 various deals that we've done in New York. And, you know, at this moment, we have about 10 deals that are current there. 
Um, New York is, you know, it's it's a strong market if you know what you're doing, and it's a horrible market if you don't know what you're doing. And so you got to be very, very finicky. I've started my career in 2000, sorry, 1995 out of New York City. So sat on the board of the state of New York as an advisor for about nine years. So we really are, you know, we really are deep in New York. And while I don't live in New York for the last five years, we moved down with my wife and kids down here to Miami. Um, we obviously visit New York a lot and we're very, very close to everything that's going on. So we feel good with this market on specific locations and specific, specific projects, which we love to do. Many of you here on the Zoom have participated with us on some of those preferred equity positions and other situations as well. Florida is a market that we're growing and expanding. Now, Florida also, you know, people like to paint Florida as a broad brush. Uh, we're going to take a look exactly at what's happening in Florida. Nothing is a broad brush. Everything is a conversation that is down to the neighborhood and down to the street and down to the location. Real estate is extremely, extremely local and very much affected by everything that works and going on around it. And so while we love Florida, we love that there's no taxes and we love the environment and we certainly love the weather, we're very, very picky of where in Florida. And so, for example, for a very long period of time, for over a number of years, you know, we, you know, we, we see a lot of projects, we ask to be participate in a lot of projects, we say no to certain locations. And today, um, it, it shows off why. Um, you know, certain parts of Florida, um, certain cities in Florida are extremely oversupplied. And they're unable to sort of like, you know, work through uh, the uh, the excessive vacancy or the drops in valuations and everything else. Now, South Florida is a very different conversation, and that's where all of our investments are. However, having said that, you know, we also have to watch out for pricing and also some oversupply situations. So, it's, you know, everything goes through a very, very tough grind before we say yes to a transaction. Um, and uh, that's just uh, that's just how we roll. Um couple of words about the state of the market, which really drives, okay, really drives how we uh, operate. What do we look for? So we're obviously in a very, very different part of the market, right? We spoke about it before. If you talk, if you talk about a market cycle, a market cycle is essentially a, a 10 to 12 year type of a phenomena where when it, you'll have three dominant different silos, if you will, where the first silos is maybe we should start with the the first silo is basically coming out of a recession or in a recession or in some sort of a downturn. It doesn't always have to be a recession, but certainly a downturn. Represented in this current uh, in this current time is kind of like the period immediately following from the Fed's decision in March of 2022 to start increasing interest rate, and they went after it in a very very aggressive way. Nine concurrent. Uh, uh, increase in interest rate, the market didn't have a chance to calibrate. And that is why, or that is the first indications of a market that's about to start to take a hit. Some individuals kept on buying, some individuals think that, you know, kept on, you know, they, they, they're sort of like the uh, the, the, the winds of, uh, were in the back of everyone because we went through kind of like a period coming out of late 2020 into 2021, which was a boom period and a super euphoric type of a situation into that period. So that's when we stopped uh, doing acquisitions. That's when we stopped and we waited for the market to calibrate. It's a good period of time to look deep into your own projects and to do your own asset management to sort of like make sure everything is kind of like tight and, and the portfolio is doing well. Um, and then we've reached uh, what appeared to be the bottom, right? So in our case, we've waited about a year we started seeing, you know, deals coming back to us. We started seeing all sorts of, you know, opportunities that we've said no to before coming back discounted again and again. Basically, you know, if you look from what we call what we think we are in the in the trough from peak to trough, there's about a twenty five percent drop in all commercial real estate valuation directly, directly, absolutely directly correlated to the cost of capital, um, and so. With this in mind, right, with this first part, this first two, three years type of a situation between the drop that you don't want to touch anything, right? It's called a, a fallen life syndrome. That when the first drop, the first year, maybe 14 months, you want to wait for the market to kind of like reach a bottom or get close to a bottom. Nobody really knows where the bottom is, only in hindsight. But ultimately, we want to know that we are at a period of time where we've actually seen a good amount of a discount from, from the peak. 
it takes about 12, 14 months to reach that point. At that point, we started getting active again. And many of you here uh, saw what we saw, understood why we're excited about this market. Just like Blackstone says, we actually do our best work in this market. It's a lot less capital available. Banks are pulling back, hard to get loans. All the large capital, all the institutional capital is not playing. That's the type of time that we want to come in and we want to do uh, we want to do well. And, you know, we'll talk about a couple of transactions that we've recently completed, and we'll take a look at how those transactions fared from maybe a few years ago. And uh, so a lot of what we do is focus around the rentals right now, and we're tracking basically what is happening in, in the world of rentals. Um, you know, so phenomenal of rental in the United States is essentially if you're looking at any family, a medium family, they're finding it extremely, extremely hard to buy their home, to buy their condo right now. Cost of capital is expensive. Prices are still very high. They went up extremely high during, during the pandemic and immediately following the pandemic. And while some markets have seen some drops of 5%, 7%, even if there's some very soft markets with a 15% drop, it still doesn't catch up with where prices were in 2019. So it's extremely expensive. It's a very expensive proposition to buy something. Alex uh, did a good job and actually wanted to, to push this point through showing various markets and how the deviation between a buy, a rent versus rent type of a scenario happened in those markets. So let's just take the most aggressive example. First lineup, Austin round Georgetown, Texas, right? So Austin, Texas. Austin, we, we all know this market as you know, Elon Musk is uh, bringing Tesla over there, is making this giant uh, campus, and so did Google, and so did all the other ones. Brought tons of jobs, tons of employment. Every announcement like this basically meant that five, seven, ten new mega towers, rental towers, started rising up, trying to capture all this uh, uh, new supply of West Coast individuals, you know, from from either Silicon Valley or other location coming in with big salaries. And so this bubble of, of extreme, extreme uh, buildings and everywhere cranes has been going on. And so what we're seeing today, right, it's a market that it's trying to kind of like catch up with itself. Um, a lot of the apartments or buildings are sitting vacant to the tune of 85% occupants, occupancy. Rents are coming down, concessions all over the place. It's not uncommon to walk into Austin and to get three months free rent and discount of this. And we don't have to, you know, so it's it's very, very hard market and a lot of supply, extremely hard supply. And of course, a lot of that issues also had to uh, trickle over to the home ownership. And so we looked at the median uh, size of a mortgage, just a median size mortgage, right? And compared it to what a median size rent is in the very same market. And you can see that it's a striking, the vast uh, uh, difference. So if you're a young family and you're trying to kind of like get your first one bedroom, maybe two bedrooms, and your average or your median uh, mortgage is about 562,000, your monthly carry cost, okay, or just a mortgage before, taxes, before everything else that you have to carry, homeowner insurance, all the other, uh, homeowner association insurance and stuff on, you'll be paying about $3,600, right? At the very same apartment today, you can rent it for less than $1,500. That's a tremendous difference. It's a difference of about 144%. It's a big impact of over $2,000. And that's the most aggressive one, but it also follows through in other locations such as Arizona, other locations such as New York and New Jersey and so on. So what does it really mean to us, right? So what do I care about? People can not can get mortgages and mortgages are more expensive and people will prefer to most likely to buy before, I'm sorry, most likely to rent before they'll buy. Basically means that, you know, the demand will continue being strong. And while certain markets we want to watch out for, or maybe want to look into very, very carefully, Austin is now a market on our radar because it's going through its own internal crisis. Phoenix is now back on our radar because of the oversupply, right? Because of all those issues. This is where we're going to find opportunities. We're looking at those markets and we're saying the disparity between buying and between renting is so severe, it's going to make sense for people to keep on renting. The demand is going to keep on coming. However, those markets are also oversupplied. And so we've seen a big drop in rents and with it, a big drop in values. 
It's exactly what we're looking for in this period of time. Going back to that conversation, silo number one, market's coming down, more money is expensive, banks are not lending as, expensive, as fast, big capital is on the sidelines. There's a lot of headline, right? Uh, newspapers, articles. It's risky. It's coming down. All those different things. These are the markets that we love. These are the best markets for us. Following that, obviously, we go into more of a stabilized situation, which I expect will happen sometime in the next six to nine to 12 months. We're going to reach some sort of a stabilization. I believe we're at the bottom, and I believe that sometime in the next six months, nine months, maybe a year. I don't think it's going to even be a year, but we're going to start coming out of it, right? With the first cracks of the feds into the interest rate, right? We'll talk about this in a moment. I think the market will start kind of like, you know, shaking itself off. Uh, we're seeing much more default today than we've ever seen before on the multifamily space and other asset classes, certainly on office. A lot of that stuff, the, the market is shedding off the excess, the, uh, the, the over levered, all those deals that didn't work out, that were sort of like built on a lot of a hot air are now kind of getting flushed. The market is going through its own correction. The 25% drop is, of course, on a national scale. If you look at certain markets, it hasn't been that severe. Um, maybe the drops have been lower, but nonetheless, there is no market that is not affected by a sharp increase in real estate. Uh, I'm sorry, in uh, cost of capital. We're obviously very active in Florida. Um, but where in Florida? I mentioned before that Florida should not be painted with a broad brush. Not everywhere in Florida is where we want to be. And if you look at the bottom here, we got Delta, Orlando, Cape Coral, Lakeland, Northport, Tampa. These are markets that's gotten very, very quickly oversaturated with a lot of supply. And, um, you know, markets is sort of like starting to come back up. There's been some drops anywhere from, you know, four to six to seven percent. Uh, some concessions, all those different things. The market is now starting to show first signs of stabilization and even uh, maybe a little bit of an increase, a minute increase. Which market did not get affected? Which market didn't actually held extremely, extremely strong? It's uh, the Miami uh, market. And so Miami is a market that has been growing on about, you know, in the, the, hottest, the hottest years, as much as 16%. Uh, in some pockets, even bigger than that, even 20% year over year. Over the last five years, the rental market in Miami has doubled itself, literally doubled. If, if you're paying $5,000 years ago, you're paying $11,000, you're paying $10,000 today. And so the growth is still there. A 4.19% growth, annual growth in rent is almost abnormal. It's definitely a sign of a very solid market. Eventually, it's supply and demand. So what did we do? We effectively went out and uh, invested because of that. Now invested into a market that is sort of like, you know, a subcategory of Miami, 30 minutes out, a more of a blue collar, knowing full well that not everybody salary has doubled in the last five years and people are struggling with the type of rents. Not to mention that we have a tremendous, tremendous uh, 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 vacant, uh, tremendous, tremendous uh, uh, amount of uh, of occupancy that is happening uh, in Florida and mainly in Miami. And so there's more and more individuals that are looking out uh, into the second ring, first ring, 30 minutes out, 45 minutes out. We'll talk more about this in a second. The second market that we find good amount of activity and a good amount of opportunity is New York City. So we're in New York City. Basically, New York City is facing its own challenges. One of the challenges is an extremely, extremely uh, uh, a very, very, uh, uh, very severe situation of undersupply. There's about vacancy of 1.4% right now in New York City. It's a, since 1968, this is 58 years that we have not seen a vacancy factor of 1.4%. It's just un unheard of, which means that every apartment that is available right now on a free market basis is extremely expensive. Some of you have invested with us in Meeker Street and in other projects in Brooklyn. It's not uncommon. If you look at our rent roll, we send it every quarter. If you look at our rent roll, it's not uncommon to see $125 a square foot, $140 a square foot, $105 a square foot. It's mind-boggling prices. Mind-boggling prices. We're talking about small apartments, 
500 square feet that's renting as much as $6,700. And, and the kids just can't get enough of that. It's just they can't get enough of this. So knowing full well that this level will not last, okay, what do we do? We do short-term projects. We enjoy the big swing in valuation that those type of rents is achieving to the buildings that we invest in, and then we exit. We don't stick around because ultimately it's going to come down. How is it going to come down? Well, the city's talking about it all the time. There's about 25% to as much as 40% of buildings in New York City, office buildings in New York City, that are slated for a conversion to residential. There's going to be a supply that's going to come and that's going to take a big effect on the valuation because the rents will eventually start coming down. So what do we look at? We're looking to, to short-term projects, one year, two years, three years, that sort of a thing. In and out, we want to make as much as we can, apex their return, give you as much of their return as possible, and recycle back. The second thing we want to do, we understand full well that there's a crisis, an affordability crisis in New York. So we went after affordable project. Talk about this project in a second. Inflation and interest rates, right? The two things that we watch out for, um, just to give some relevancy, because there's a lot of conversations. I'm not going to go too deep into it. But just to give some relevancy about what's the correlation, inflation and interest rate and everything that's going on. So historically, in the last 50 years, you know, the... Um, the average mortgage was around, you know, 5.4%. 5.4%. That's essentially where it was on average. The highest point was 1981 with 18%, and the lowest point was 2.65%, right? Somewhat, if you look at the median, and I don't like to look at the median, when it comes down to it, it's about 7.4. Interest rate right now has been the long term, right? The yield curve on the 10 years just, just dropped. Um, it's about 6.75, 7%. That's sort of like where it hovers. You know, if you've got really amazing credit and everything is lined up for you, maybe you'll get a six and a half. But if you're buying a home or buying a condo, it's a six, seven, five, sort of like middle of the fairway. Inflation, on the other hand, you know, we're looking at an average of 3.9, or the highest have been a little bit over 13, and the median was over a little bit over three. The sticky, sticky inflation right now of around 3%, three and a quarter, 3.6, right? that we've been seeing in the last year after it was as much as high as 9.6% in the later part, November of 2022, essentially came down quite significantly, given a lot of confidence to the market and given a lot of confidence to the environment, economic environment in the United States, of course, of course labor and everything else that's going on. However, the Fed are slated, they want to see a 2% inflation before they'll start dropping rents, uh, dropping rates. Um, I think uh, the from last week, inflation numbers came 2.9%. So we broke the three. And maybe that's the telltale sign that it's time to uh, maybe do a little bit of an easing and have the feds agree finally to drop um, to drop the interest rate. Which certainly affects everything else. Um, maybe it's too early. I don't know. Selfishly, I want to see it happen. Um we obviously borrow. We also lend, interestingly enough, but we obviously borrow. So if we'll have some easing on, on interest rate, it's going to be very positive for our project because that's obviously directly correlated to values. Lower interest rate, you know, will eventually will lead to uh, lower cap rates and lower cap rates obviously represents improvement in valuations. And so, yes, we definitely want to see it. And of course, you know, on, on, a, on a national level, every Every aspect is being affected by it. Um, it feels like it's sort of like time, right? September, just very conveniently right before the elections. Um, also, you know, employment numbers are much softer than anticipated, although there's been for some pretty phenomenal employment number for the last uh, year and a half or so. Um, you know, it's starting to, starting to show some cracks. And so there are... Now, more conversations, uh, you know, about the recession, maybe a small recession. Whether it happens or not, I mean, personally, I don't think we're going to head into a recession, but I think that there's going to be some easing that's going to be necessary. Too much easing, I think inflation will rise back up very quickly. We're already seeing the housing market react to the potential, the potential, just the conversation 
of some easing that's probably coming. And we've seen um, it's about 35% jump in refinancing activity. Just a conversation, right? They're just that's just the conversation itself had affected the yield curve, the 10 year yield curve. And so folks are kind of like refinancing already. Um, and there's a lot of activity in that space. And uh, it's uh, it's quite interesting. So I think, yeah, well, good a good break of maybe 25 or 50 basis points, which we pray for will happen. But I don't think that they need to move too quick. Uh, we do need to keep our eye on inflation and everything else. So, What's all this value? What's all this information? What's all this jargon? Why do we read so much? Why do we philosophize so much? Why do we do that? So we can make better determinations of where to take our capital and yours and invest it in areas where we know it's going to be solid. Solid is the idea, right? We want to know that it's going into areas where it's needed. We see a crisis in Miami. Everything is expensive for Florida. Everything is expensive. Things have doubled over the course of, of five years, double. Some years it jumps 15%, some years it jumped as much as 25%, and it's still going up, and it's not showing any signs of relief. And so we want to be in an area where we can offer tremendously great product, amazingly good product, but we want to offer it at a discount. 354-unit ground-up multifamily is a project that many of you here, or at least some of you here have participated in an area that is right outside of uh, Miami, in Homestead, an area that used to be ah, kind of finicky, but now everything is on fire. Everything is good. The demand is so strong. So 35 minutes out, you can get yourself a gorgeous two-bedroom apartment, $2,400. Do you know what you can get in Miami for $2,400? Most likely a glorified closet. Uh, in New York, we're seeing the opportunity. Where do we find it? We find it in doing something fantastic for the community, building or being participating in a building to build 49 units, rental units, that will be essentially only slated for families that have went through all sorts of financial crisis and other type of crisis. And this will be effectively the permanent housing. And so we've created ourselves an accelerated position and preferred equity position with current pay. So one it represents the one on the right, Miami-Dade Homestead represents to our investors a 24% annual return. The other one represents to our investors Really fantastic cash flow, 16, 16.3% cash flow, IRR. And so we create that sort of a balance between, you know, put some money in and see some nice returns in two and a half years or three, or actually put some money in and get yourself an ongoing passive income, 16% on your money. I think it's a little better than what the banks are offering today, if I'm not mistaken. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of our projects. As I mentioned, we have 35 projects, 36 projects from inception. And every month we're going to have a discussion. We'll talk about the market. We'll talk about activities. But we'll also talk about our asset management. So we'll take three projects. We'll take a look at them. This particular project is in Florida. It's a gorgeous building with 293 apartments, rental apartments, a place called Dania Beach. Why is Dania Beach so interesting? It's because it's nestled on the beach between Miami and between Fort Lauderdale, two super expensive markets. I always believe that, you know, let those markets kind of like uh, manage, but, you know, the spillover is what we're looking for. And so this particular market, we've underwrote it very conservatively. We took uh, a preferred equity position. Uh, projected annual return is 18.9%. I'm saying projected, and I'm saying preferred in the same sentence. Um, because we have a little bit of a kicker, right? A little bit of an equity kicker. So we have an 18%, I believe, yeah, I believe it's an 18% fixed income a year. And then we have a small kicker that will bring us up to 18.9%. And then investors, and that's that's Aster level. We take a little bit of a promote off of that. Uh, the building is being completed. We're now we're going through the first, um, uh, the first 40 units. I think we've, actually got the certificate of occupancy just now uh, in uh, in August. And the first 40 tenants are moving in. It's 293. Here's a picture of the building on the right. Some of you have actually went on tours in this building. Uh, it's pretty cool, uh, pretty cool property. We underwrote it conservatively. We underwrote rents that are much, much lower than what we're seeing today, which is really cool. Again, we're not participating in the upside, but we're also not uh, affected by the downside. Our position is very, very strong. How much strong? 
It'll give you an indication. The mortgage is $76 million. Our last dollars, including profits, is I think 6.7, call it $7 million. So you know, 76, 7 million, you know, call it $83 million or just shy of $83 million, where the valuation itself is about 124, 121, depends on how you want to underwrite it, right? So we have tons of equity, we have over $30 million of equity after we get paid with our profits to accelerate, okay, our position. And so our investors are going to be doing really well, but also the preservation of capital, right? The risk associated with the deal is very, very low. That's in fact how we're um, how we're looking at the valuation today based on year one. You know, we always do like a forward projection, one year forward projections. If we were to sell today, the valuation would have been 124 million and grows from there. You can see here at the bottom, this is basically, we'll uh, linger here for a couple of seconds. Uh, Second project that we're doing um, is we just completed a rollover from Meeker. So Meeker is an interesting conversation. Meeker is a building we've actually built together with the sponsor, uh, stabilized out of it. We had a program that we do a rollover. A rollover essentially means that we want to keep our money out on a preferred basis um, for a period of three years. Uh, the projects are short, right? And so we allow our developing partner to offer us another opportunity that we underwrite, that we like, that he's very like kind in many, many ways to the very same property. It has to be multifamily, cannot be a hotel or office or anything else. It can be somewhat similar number of units, certainly the same location, and definitely very important to have the same type of level of financing, right? You don't want to move from one project that's 70% financing into a project that's 85% because that changes the risk level for us. So we've done that and about a, a week or so ago, we just uh, sent our investors their return. They're once a year in those particular projects, once a year, there's a return of 21.4% uh, to our investors, which we distribute on an annual basis. And by the third year, obviously, will be distribution of returns and also the principal amount. And so we just moved from 352 Meeker. Um, very nice building facing the BQE. So noisy, unbelievable. So noisy. Um, is this just, I have to, I hate to say it, it's just a noise pollution, unbelievable. And the building is getting rents that are just mind boggling, just mind boggling. Uh, and so we moved over to a sweet spot in North Williamsburg, 310 North 7th Street. And we did our distribution right now. We're in the process of building 310 North 7th Street, which is a phenomenal location in Williamsburg, one of the strongest neighborhoods in Brooklyn and certainly in New York City. Um, a little bit more about sort of like, you know, how we looked at both projects. The first one, uh, the loan to cost, the loan to values, the stuff that we look at and before we make our own determinations, you know, but you can see that there's a lot of similarities. They're both, you know, the one is 27 units, the other one is 31 units. Average units is 524. The other one is a little bit larger, 573. Very, very similar, uh, you know, very similar characteristics. And so we just embarked on that project. And within a year from now, there's going to be the second, of course, the second distributions of 21.4%. So we find all sorts of interesting positions to um, to to not just create return. I mean, it's it's I got to say it's beyond uncommon to take a preferred position and to offer investors over 20% returns, just, just uncommon, un not seen. It's really the ability of this company to go through a lot of projects and really pick up the right ones, but it's also a sign of the times, right? It's a sign of the times. You know, it's less like money, a lot less money is available today. A lot less money is out there for people to negotiate. So we are, we got the upper hand. We know how to raise, we created an amazing track record um, over many years, right? We made a lot of money to a lot of you and to ourselves, of course. And so we've built this trust. We've built this trust on a collective basis. And so we know how to raise, we know how to bring money to projects and that makes a big difference for investors and for developers. Gravesend is a very unique project uh, that we are doing. It's a $60 million project. Um, over there, we identified a very unique opportunity. It's uh, in location 
that is mainly mainly occupied by a Syrian Jewish community. It's a pocket in Brooklyn, none very unassuming pocket in Brooklyn. It is extremely wealthy, extremely, extremely wealthy. You know, there's a lot of Jewish communities. That particular community is extremely wealthy, one of the wealthiest communities in the United States. And they're very much clinish. They all live around their synagogues and houses of worship, and they have to have walking distance. You know, you don't drive on Shabbat. You don't drive on high holidays. You have to walk. And it's sort of like all family-oriented and stuff like this. Every house that's up for sale over there, if it's an older house, it gets torn down. It gets maybe attached with another lot, and then they build this $10, $12 million, $14 million mansions. Not everybody can afford this stuff. And so nobody was there to build any uh, any condos, any options. It was either a house or pretty much nothing. The one competitor that we've had a block and a half away is a building that was built more than 13, 14 years ago. I have to say quite mediocre condo building. It was quite mediocre. And we started looking at the price point that this building was getting, and it was close to $2,000 a square foot. On average, 17 and change, with some exception at $1,900 a square foot. We underwrote this deal knowing that we're buying the land to build only 12 units. We underwrote the deal at $1,550 a square foot. This is where we are in timeline. The building, uh, the deal commenced on January 22nd. This is obviously where we are today. Um, you know, and uh, we knew we were looking into a very, very strong uh, investment. And... Uh, but I don't think that we essentially, uh, I don't think that we essentially uh, imagined that it's going to take this turn. And so we went at around 1548 a square foot. You can see on the right side, okay, gross ready sales value. This is the original. And you can see to the right of it, the revised. We felt we're going to do sales at around 42 million. Our mark to market based on sales today, we have about four potentially maybe fifth sale are $2,293, so almost $2,300. That's a tremendously large difference on dollars per square foot. And so, you know, once we looked at, if you look at the bottom where we covered it in green, the original conversation was that our investors are going to be making around 24% a year. We are now looking at 34% a year and that's taking a lot more conservative approach because if I'll really show the investors what I think they'll be making, they'll flip. I think we're going to break the 40% mark year over year, annual return net to our investors. So you know, it happens sometimes that we hit the ball out of the park and uh, we're quite happy with this project. But again, it has to finish. Right now, we've started sales about a month, month and a half ago. Five units are already gone. Their supply is approaching zero. We're pretty much the only game in town and everybody wants a piece of the action. Everybody's going after this building. All the neighborhood is after it. The community is is really bragging about it. So it's, I think if you know, if you take a look at the finishes, this is a super high level finishes. We had to do some upgrades uh, to the finishes because we're really going after, you know, what those individuals want, and which is a super high finish, very, very high uh you know type of buyers and uh you know less affected by issues such as interest rate and everything else because most guys most families are buying it all cash um final project so before before you move on we do have a question from the audience can you spend a second on talking about your view about the future of mixed use deals rental plus retail specifically um sure the future, interesting, I gave a, I gave a talk. Um, um, I, I was on a panel. The panel was focused on, on mixed use um, and the future of mixed use and everything else. Um, it was with uh, the Observer, right? It was for it was a conference of the Observer and I was sitting on a panel and we we're discussing about it. Um, so, you know, just a little bit about, about the, you know, the concept of mixed use. So mixed use, you know, we have, there's, there's two types of mixed use. And today the concept of mixed use is, is a lot more sophisticated than it once was. Um, today you'll either have a vertical village, which is a building that will have retail in it. The, the base of the building will have retail. And then you'll have some sort of a office component, right? Some sort of a 
shared office uh, or office component in it, sort of like, so, so imagine ground floor retail, coffee shop, restaurants, um, you know, maybe a place to do your nails, maybe a place to cut your hair, all sorts of things that you would need on your day-to-day, -day, a place to shop, uh, grab your bagel, that sort of thing. Office component where you can get meetings, not just do your Zoom call, but get meetings, bring your teammates, um, stuff like that. Residential above, right, where you live, and then all the in between common areas where the rooftop is activated, might have a restaurant, might have a bar, uh, the swimming pool is activated, all those things are activated. The other side of, of this conversation is outside of cities, which is really the complex that we were investing in, the 350, 354 units, which is sort of like a horizontal, horizontal type of a conversation. And in that, you have the residential that's curated perfectly with some retail, like we have over there, we have about 45,000 square feet of retail, uh, I'll buy it designed by a different developer, but it's all part of the same 20 acre complex. So we have 12 acres, only residential, 354, and it's all sort of like flowing into streets and the streets are now covered with eight acres of, of retail. Now, what's the impact? The impact on the bottom line is that people today, especially this generation, has a much bigger preference to be close to work and to be close to uh, where they want to hang out and to be close, everything should be close to where they live. So it's kind of like the live, work, play environment, right? And if you want to go somewhere, you might as well do it through either walk or get on a bicycle ride for a few moments and just get there. And that's sort of like where this generation, right? This generation Z and, and the millennials, this is where they're driving it to. We already looked, it's becoming very, very expensive to buy. And so... We're paying attention to that, right? And so we're looking to projects. You know, it's easy to do it in the city because the city is already by definition, all those things combined. In buildings, however, when you do vertical buildings, you know, buildings that offer those amenities, the ability to hang out with your friends and have a beer after work and live in the same building and grab a coffee at the morning and actually do a meeting with 12 of your colleagues in the same building because the facilities are there and they have office are getting significant premiums, a big, big premiums, so as much as 40% premiums. Same thing goes also to those, you know, vertical, uh, to those horizontal uh, mixed use communities, we're seeing big premiums. So imagine Homestead, which is sort of like, you know, lots of empty spaces, roads in between, and then you have a complex with about 300 and something units. And imagine that there's another complex that has all of that, but also retail, and all those services is part of it, where you don't have to get into your car and start driving around and looking for, buy your milk and, and get your coffee and, and uh, get to a restaurant with your wife. The difference is quite starting. Now, while we're when we're underwriting, we don't put those numbers in. We know that the impact is there and it exists and, and it is quite severe. So I can talk for two hours just about um, mixed use and future of mixed use and I'm going to much more details, but thank you for your questions. I'm going to jump back in i have about eight minutes to finish okay red hook i spoke about our projects everything is great but this particular project is going slower this is a small project 22 apartments we sold 16 of them six are still lingering and it's been dragging and dragging and dragging i know that uh, we as i said every quarter we sort of like you know look to see we did the mark to market valuation this particular project is getting longer uh, we anticipated a 70% return, and we're now looking at around 58% return. And uh, it's quite shameful because it's just going just going longer. Um, I think it's a good project. It's part of it's in Brooklyn. Um, we are getting higher numbers. We anticipated $1,200 a square foot. Uh, we're seeing $1,300 a square foot. Uh, but still, time takes longer. We're expecting this thing to finish between 36 to 42 months. 60 months, we're still, obviously the building is beautiful and it's built and it's still taking longer. We have six more units. Uh, we are out of the woods. We're out of the danger zone because we have about a half a million dollar left with the mortgage. I think we've had about $22 million. You definitely don't want to get stuck in a slow market and a big mortgage. That's a big no-no. So we have about only a half a million dollars. The next unit that we'll sell will kill the mortgage entirely. But that's um, that's a project that we're not super happy with, and it happens, right? You know, if you're investing in real estate, you have to understand that those things can happen. As I said, we have zero losses, 
And sometimes we hit the ball out of the park, but sometimes it happens that the market is soft and things take longer. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. It's gorgeous apartments, beautiful apartments, um, and in a great location in Brooklyn. And still it's moving extremely, extremely slow. Um, well, I guess I'm at the end of the presentation here. And uh, I don't know if we have any other questions, but um, I'm happy to answer anything else that uh, that you might uh, you might have uh, here for me. Joe, perhaps you want to talk about our upcoming pipeline. I've had a couple of investors reach me um, during this Zoom saying, what is on our radar? What are we looking at participating in next? Do you want to, whilst uh, giving anyone else an opportunity to make the most of Joe and ask some live questions, perhaps talk about what's on our radar over the next couple maybe, of months? Maybe, maybe I can ask Andrew, because uh, I didn't give him so much space to speak today. <laughs> Andrew, you're... Uh... You're holding a baby on your left hand, or are you ready to talk? Uh, I actually am. I'm here with uh, our youngest <laughs> analyst. This is Liam. He's the youngest analyst yeah. at Aster. Youngest analyst, youngest investor. Um, <laughs> so maybe uh, maybe you or Alex might be better to uh, <laughs> to take that. My man, Liam. Uh, really fantastic. Alex, you want to say a couple of words of what's, uh, what's coming due? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we're seeing some interesting projects. I think, you know, we're about to uh, to do another project in Brooklyn, right? Maybe that's a good opportunity to introduce it or is it too early yet? Oh, I think yeah, I can say a couple of words. I mean, it's almost identical to the other one. Yeah, so it's essentially, we mentioned in the presentation that we're just uh, closing on a, on a project in Brooklyn uh, that is with a city program. And essentially with that same developer, we have, I guess, a plug and play um, copy and paste project, uh, not all too far away from that project. Uh, it's on, it's a, it's a housing, uh, development, um, by the city also that, that are paying for the rents. And I think that's a uh, pretty exciting, will be a preferred equity, um, investment also. Uh, besides that, we're seeing projects, to, you know, throughout the United States, I think today, I think we've seen another one from a group that we've been tracking um, in Florida, in Orlando. Um, and besides that, we've uh, also been looking at a loan. Um, so we're looking at all different types of 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 investments at the moment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I'll uh, expand a little bit and then I'll answer Austin's question. Um, so I think the idea right now we're able to achieve such high returns on income type deals that uh, the interest to take the risk associated with is a little bit diminished there has to be something like really exceptional really exceptional you know if i can offer investors 24 percent return annual uh like on a deal that we're doing in Olmsted, i think it's exceptional the group itself exceptional the story solid everything is great a very, very few and far between. So right now, I'm very happy. We're very happy to look at deals where we can offer you, um, uh, you know, amazing returns, right? I, I don't know how long it's going to last that we're going to be able to offer you 16%, 17 18% cash flow. It's quite uncommon. It's a sign of the times. I've said it time and time again. So we have uh, aspirations to, to do a lot more uh, debt deals. And debt deals essentially means we're going to be lending money and create an arbitrage. We have a number of banks that is working that are working with us to place capital out uh, as first position lenders, where we inside our loan a big chunk of it, seventy percent of it, we kind of like bring a lender, a regular national lender. We pay the lender around eight and a half percent. We charge the project a lot more. We create an arbitrage that allows us to make anywhere from twenty to twenty-two percent return cash on cash on the equity that we bring to the project. I know I said a lot. Uh, eventually, I'll, I'll give a whole presentation about it. But I just want you to understand that we're reducing the risk significantly, significantly, while still being able to offer you high things type of returns on a monthly or a quarterly basis. Okay. I uh, 
very much inspired by that. And, and the response from all of you has been quite tremendous. The last raise that we've done, we were looking for four and a half or 4.6 million. We came back with over six, uh, six plus million dollars uh, in, in demands. And, um, and it was it was quite inspiring. And so we get the, you know, we, we take the temperature from you guys and we get the level of comfort and that's what leads us because what you want is what we look to seek, right? Um, let me address something that Scott said. Are we creating value through, uh, you know, through operations or through uh, exit? So uh, depends on the deal. If it's equity, a lot of the equity deals that we do are ground up. I think it's cleaner. And if you work with the right type of operating partners, knowing what we know is that, you know, billion with over 4.1 million square feet of real estate, building is the right way to go. It's the cleanest thing. Now there's great companies that are doing really well by stepping into existing buildings, cash flow in buildings, you know, reducing expenses, reducing water consumption, all kinds of different things and sort of like creating value that way. We have just a handful of value add deals. Why? Because I'm looking for hyper returns, hyper returns while adjusting the risk level as low. So that's kind of like the story of our company. This is why we're able to show returns even throughout those period of time that are completely outside um, of uh, of you know of what uh, of what the market is. Um, so so it's not through operations, it's really through creating value by building an asset, right? Taking a piece of dirt, envisioning what's needed, building it, creating it, and that's essentially how we do it. Um, oh, very nice. Thank you very much, uh, Giselle. Uh, Giselle just said, Scott and I are new at Aster. Hearing your update makes it feel comfortable. And we're both looking forward to investing more. But thank you. I'm looking forward to doing more deals together with you and with Scott. And I really appreciate it. Um, we're at the top of the hour. And I think that uh, Laura is going uh, uh, to close it up. So please go ahead, Laura. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, Joe, I personally, I think that we definitely achieved our goal here. As I said at the beginning, we are very, very passionate about providing full transparency into our portfolio. That is the intention of these sessions. Of course, as to many of our investors who are here today, you know that I'm available at the end of the phone really majority of the time, as is Joe, as is uh, Alex and Andrew and Marika, who, you know, give us support on more, um, you know, de detailed things that I can get to. So I strongly and firmly can say on the behalf of the entire team, thank you very much for joining us. We look forward to presenting our next opportunity to you. Um, if you don't have my information, I will drop it in the, you all have my information, you've been receiving the emails, but let me just drop it into the chat right now, uh, whilst I play a short ending video. And uh, thank you, Joe, any any final words whilst I just drop my info in? No, I just want to echo what Marika said. Thank you all for your vote of confidence. And if we haven't had the pleasure of working together, feel free to reach out, ask questions, we're here for you. Thank you again. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Take care. Thank you so much, everyone. You work hard for your money. It's time to make your money work just as hard for you. You will have a secure future if you were to use Aster. Hi, my name is Raquel El Khadif, and I'm a realtor with Broker Nation Real Estate in South Florida. Hi, my name is Elena. I'm originally from New York, now currently living in Miami. First and foremost, I was looking uh, for my investors for institutional level investment. And the beauty of Aster is that an investor can come in with relatively a small amount of money and still be part of a big project with high returns. Over the years, I've had many experiences with investing, I've learned so much and approximately five years ago I ran into a company, Aster, and found that they completed my investment approach. They are so selective with their projects. The returns that they project are always high 
but the track record is even higher than that. So it's kind of an element of uh, under-promising and over-delivering, which I liked, of course. Just based on years of uh, trial and error and other companies that I've invested with, that they are far superior to all the other options that I've tried. And it gives me and the investors some peace of mind. I like that with Aster, I can sit back and have my money working for me. They attract seasoned developers. I feel very safe and secure with my investments with them. I fell in love with them. And I only use them now for my investments. You guys made us feel like we're part of the family, and I thank you for that.